since Lost in Space was left unresolved, uh, I wanted to resolve it. So I had co-written a screenplay, which I took to CBS, and they wanted to do it. I then took it to 20th Century Fox. They wanted to do it. I took it to the cast. They wanted to do it. Uh, and then I took it to Irwin Allen. Kind of like, hey, we can't lose here. But Irwin didn't want to read it. Irwin didn't want to talk about it. Uh, he didn't want to go back to any of his past television projects. He was a big Oscar-winning filmmaker at that point in time, and uh, he didn't want to go back to his TV stuff. So he uh, basically said that if there ever was a time when he wanted to go back and do Lost in Space, either as a feature or as a television movie of the week, you know, it would be his script and it would be his idea, and he'd call my agents, and that would be that. And that was the last time I talked to Irwin, and that was, I think, 1980. And then I used some of those ideas from my script when I was l writing the Lost in Space comic book. So I got to get some of it out. Bobby was extremely passionate about his role, okay? I mean, I wouldn't say he was a method actor, but the guy really loved being the robot. I mean, you know, his, his chair was painted silver. His dressing room was painted silver. Uh, and he just loved being in there. You'd think, I would think that any opportunity I would get to get out of there whenever I could, if I were in the robot, I would get me out of here, cut, fine, let me out of here. You know, uh, Bobby was very comfortable in there and he, was, he, he did a fantastic job as the robot. I mean, I can't sing his praises highly enough as the, the actor that he was inside there because not only did he have to memorize and give us all of the dialogue, he had to do the technical stuff at the same time, plus be inside this, you know, fiberglass shell, plus uh, at many times carry the burden of like hundreds of pounds on his shoulders and still be able to, to act. I, I mean, he's an unsung hero of the 60s. But he did get a little overly passionate, I think, about the robot. So one day, Mark Goddard and I used to constantly goof around. We used to steal producers' golf carts and drive them out to the moat on the back lot and throw them in the water. I mean, I can't get sued for that now, can I? I mean, we used to do a lot of stuff during lunch and things, just for fun, just to, just to goof around. So one day we were breaking for lunch, <clears throat> as I recall, if memory serves me well. I've been watching the O.J. Simpson trial, I have to, as I recall. Um, anyway. We were going to lunch, and the uh, effects guys were about to get Bobby out of the robot so he could go to lunch. And, and Mark and I said to, I think it was Stu Moody, one of our wonderful special effects guys, who would always tell you, don't worry, everything's safe. <laughs> you know, he had, like, no fingers. <laughs> He'd always tell you, not to worry about it. You're going to be okay. He'd <laughs> like, oh, are you, Stu? Are you sure? <laughs> anyway, um, we said, don't worry, Stu. We'll let Bobby out of the robot. You go on ahead to lunch. So everyone left the set, and Mark and I left Bobby alone in the middle of the stage 11, and it was like the, the sand exterior set. He was out there in the middle about some foam rubber rocks, and, and we left him there. That was it. We just said, let's <coughs> leave Bobby in the robot and go to lunch. Well, we were gone maybe, you know, five or ten minutes. It wasn't like leave him in there for an hour. We were gone a few minutes, and we looked at each other and said, oh, we can't. We can't leave Bobby in there. You know, that's not fair. It's... Let's, we've had our little joke. Let's go back and let him out now. So Mark and I are walking back to the set, and the doors are open, and we can see, uh, you know, 30 yards away, there's the robot in the middle of the set, and there's smoke coming out of the robot. And Mark and I look at each other like, oh, oh, my God, like, what if one of those wires inside, one, maybe Bobby was trying to get out, and one of these wires fell down, and, like, burnt him to a crisp, he's sizzled, he's, he's electrified, and oh my, we've killed him, we've electrocuted him. We start running to the robot thinking, oh, you know, this is, ter this is like beyond bad. This is like we've like killed Bobby May or something here. This is, we're really upset. We take it, start to get the thing out of the bubble. Here's Bobby May holding a little pen flashlight, smoking a cigar, not a cigarette, he's smoking a cigar. He's holding a pen flashlight and he's reading The Hollywood Reporter. Could have been the variety, but he's sitting there reading a trade, smoking a cigar with a pen flashlight. He's happy as a clam. He's totally fine that he's in the robot. It's like, oh, hi, Mark. Hi, Bill. Hey, did you know Disney's making it? It was like, unbelievable. Unbelievable. He had to be there, but uh, 
the best of my knowledge, that's how it occurred. Guy Williams taught me how to fence. You know, Jonathan taught me comic timing. You know, uh, Mark and I, Mark was like, I wanted to be Robin to his Batman. Uh, Bobby and I worked great together. Marta Kristen turned me on to Bob Dylan, something I'll always thank her for. You know, I fell madly in love with Angela Cartwright. That was a great thing. Uh, June has kept our little group together over the years by calling everyone and making sure we'd get together for a lunch here and there. She's a great rock and roll, wonderful woman who expanded my mind by playing Scrabble with me whenever she could. It was a great group, still is a great group. Love to do it again someday.